Every autumn, millions of Hindus observe the beautiful festival of lights, called Diwali. In addition to lamp lighting, they light firecrackers. Where did this festival that celebrates light over darkness, the triumph of good over evil, come from? What's its origins? We shall find out. The earliest evidence for Diwali is the 7th century AD play by King Harsha Nagananda. The earliest uh, descriptions of Diwali occur in the Skanda Purana dating to the 10th century AD. Following is Skanda Purana 2.4.9 and it's the description of Diwali. The part of the night on the five lunar days beginning from the 12th day of the dark half of Kartika. The first lamp indicates the fortnight, the second the month, the third the season, the fourth the ayana, and the fifth lamp the year. Thus the lamp shall indicate auspiciousness and inauspiciousness. Lamps are born parts of the sun, they are the dispeller of darkness. Let them illuminate me in all three units of time and let them indicate auspiciousness or otherwise. A month prior, Vala Kilnya said, the devotee should perform this vrat on the 14th day in the dark half of the month of Ashwina near about the festival of light. The 13th day in the dark half of the month of Ashwina, the devotee should offer Yamadipa in the early part of the night with oblations too. A premature death can be avoided thereby. Former son of the sun be pleased along with Mirtu, along with the noose and the rod. Kala as well as Ma be pleased because a lamp has been offered to the Trayo Desi day. After reciting this mantra, a person who offers excellent lamp at the entrance of the house in the early part of the night of the 13th day of the dark half of the month of Ashwin every year. Now, let's look at this interesting thing. For the destruction of Naraka, the devotee should stir and roll Apa Marga Dumbi Prapunnata in the water kept for bath. Now, skip ahead later into the chapter to show the most interesting clue as to the origins of Deepavali. Verses 65 to 68 of the chapter say this. When the sun is in Libra, on the nights of Chaturdasi and New Moon Day, men should celebrate the festival of showing the path unto the pithers with firebrands in their hands. The dead men and ghosts who are in hell see the path due to this vrata always. No doubt, indeed, need to be entertained in this respect by leading sages. Thing because when the sun is in Libra, at least when this text was being written, the autumnal equinox began. And this is when the sun is directly above the equator and the day and night lengths are equal during this classical antiquity period. The 13th day of the dark half of Ashvina would fall roughly around the autumnal equinox. However, why is it that some Hindu traditions celebrate Deepavali in Kartika and the other Hindu traditions celebrate it in Ashvina? This ties back to the autumnal equinox. Due to axial position where the Earth's axis wobbles, the Sun is no longer in Libra when the autumnal equinox occurs. Now, instead of Libra, the autumnal equinox is when the sun is in the middle of Virgo. It means the zodiac has shifted a month. Originally, the lunar month of Ashwina corresponded to the solar month of Libra and Kartika to Scorpio. The medieval Indians dealt with this procession of equinoxes by assuming still that the equinox occurred in Libra and end up assuming that the equinox occurred a month later than it actually occurred meant that autumnal equinox and by extension the Pavali was set to Kartika instead of Ashvina. Calendrical traditions dealt with the procession of equinox by moving the lunar months with the solar months, thus shifting the lunar calendar by a month. And by the time of the Padma Purana, which was composed a while after the Skanda Purana, we find the mentions of the Pavali similar rites and similar practices, but on Kartika, officially. Sri Shiva said, O Kartikeya, on the 13th lunar day of the dark half of Kartika, a man should offer a light to Yama outside, thereby ultimately death is avoided. May the sun's son with death, having a noose in his hand and with his wife, be pleased due to the offering of light. Those who are scared of sin should necessarily bathe at moonrise on the 14th day of the dark half of Kartika. The rest of the Padma Purana mentions similar themes as that of the Skanda Purana in regards to Deepavali. Interesting themes of Deepavali is the association with Yama, the god of death. Apparently, the lights were lit to avoid death and 
to honor the ancestors who have died. One interesting thing to note is that when the sun enters Libra, the men should show the path to the pitters, which are the dead men and ghosts. People lit lamps not only to indicate auspiciousness and a light over dark, but also to light the way for the ancestors back to the people, just like the Mexican holiday of Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. In fact, this autumnal festival of the Pamali is part of a large 16 long day festival called Pitur Paksha when the people on earth would do shraddha to their ancestors or offer foods and other stuff. These themes hint a possible Indo-European origin for the, the festival. Slavs have a festival called Zayadi, which was preserved in the drama of the same name by Adam Mikiewicz. The festival was celebrated twice, once in the spring and other time in the fall. The ancestral spirits are said to return to the mortal world. Food was offered to the ancestors and a bonfire was lit to help the spirits find their way to the loved ones. And the spirits would ensure a successful harvest. Another Slavic festival that would occur is Velu Likes in Latvia. Velu Likes occurs in October. It was a feast for the dead who returned to the mortal world. The feast for the ancestors would ensure a healthy and good harvest. Likes have a festival that occurs in October. It's a harvest festival dedicated to Demeter and Persephone, both fertility goddesses, and it celebrates human and agricultural festivity. This festival was exclusively done by women and was kept secret from most of the people, so we are missing an association with the dead, but that association with the dead comes up in a different harvest festival in the spring. That festival was called Anthesteria. It was in this festival dedicated to Dionysus, where the dead were said to come back from the underworld. However, it occurred from February to March in the spring, little over half a year later. The Old Norse people had a festival called Alpha Blot. Like Thesmophoria, it was a secret festival done by women. The sacrifice is for the elves. Though there is no mention of the connection with the dead or the spirit, there are hints to it. We have one account of it in a poem called Auster Faravisur. A man called Sigvatar, a Christian, finds himself denied entry to a house, and the women of the house say, Do not come any further in, wretched fellow, said the woman. I fear the wrath of Odin. We are heathens. The disgraceable female who drove me away like a wolf without hesitation said they were holding a sacrifice to the elves inside her farmhouse. A spirit-like creature. And interestingly, they are led by Freya, who is a fertility goddess, thus the festival is associated with some sort of agriculture by a far connection. Moreover, it's interesting that the word Odin is mentioned. Odin is the leader of Valhalla, the place where the dead soldiers reside for their upcoming battle to a Ragnarok. Now let's get to the most famous autumnal pagan festival, the Celtic festival of Samhain. This harvest festival occurred halfway between the autumnal equinox and the winter solstice. And it was known that on this day, the barrier between the mortal world and the other world was at its thinnest and the spirits of the dead can cross over. We do have jack-o'-lanterns, which actually parallels fire lighting rituals, but these lanterns were to ward off spirits or represent them, not to light the way for them to come in. And these spirits were not ancestral, but malevolent yet spirits nonetheless. This Celtic festival of Samhain that is the precursor to modern day Halloween. The Indian branch of the Indo-Europeans also have this festival. Let's go back to the Skanda Purana. Skanda Purana 2.9.4.62-64 has this interesting uh, reading. After coming to the kingdom of Bali, Yakshas, Gandharvas, Kinnaras, medicinal herbs, ghosts, mantras, magic crystals, etc., all of them get delighted. They dance in the early part of the night. There is no doubt about that those mantras will be accomplished in the kingdom of Bali. Just as people coming to the kingdom of Bali are highly delighted, so also on that day the people should be full of delight. These are supernatural beings coming back to earth. In the Ashwina festival, it is mentioned as a separate festival which might relate to the Deepavali festival a month later, maybe a vestigial. It says, the Pratam's char is so-called because of its movement of the dead ancestors. Ancestors like Agnishvatas, Barhishads, 
the Ajapas and the Somapas also. The dead ancestors are called departed spirits and they move on that day. They are worshipped with Swada hymns by their sons and the sons of their sons and daughters. They, moving departed spirits, leave after being gratified by means of Shraddha's gifts and sacrifices. The spirits are seen to move on the earth on the Mahalaya. Now before we get to the Proto-Indo-European link, let's talk about the theme of harvest. Around this time of fall, the plants planted in the spring would be harvested, while new plants would be planted to be harvested in the upcoming spring. From those graphs, we can see that the harvest season ends, at least in the autumn part, around the uh, late October and November, though sometimes it goes until December. While there is no exact date that the harvest season ends, it's around the September equinox and the late October, early November that the people would uh, celebrate a successful harvest. After all, you have not only planted plants for spring, but now you have enough food to last you to the winter, which is surely worthy of celebration. These autumn festivals date to the Proto-Indo-Europeans. From the Indian and European anomalies, it doesn't seem that these harvest festivals were synced to some significant astronomical event. The Proto-Indo-Europeans likely had a harvest festival that occurred in the middle of fall season. There was a lingering theme of the dead during the autumn and winter where there might be a time period, according to the Proto-Indo-European beliefs, where the dead might return to the mortal world. The Greek festival of Anthesteria shows that the Proto-Indo-European harvest festival need not be coinciding with the festival of the dead. When the Indo-European branches split up, what must have happened was each branch independently fixed their holiday of harvest to a certain day and uh, then is fixed it to a time when the dead would return. However, it's too much of a coincidence that the Slavic and Germanic festivals would fall around the same time as Samhain, as the f Samhain time has no real astronomical significance. So my guess is that the... Celts must have influenced the Germanic and Slavic traditions, and hence you see a similarity of dates for these harvest festivals. It's likely that the fall theme of the dead was actually associated with the upcoming winter, which is why the dead coming back in the spring when winter ends is found in the Greek version. Certain though is that the Indo-Europeans believed that there was a day where the dead returned to earth. So it's likely that the idea of using fire to light the way for the ancestors developed independently between the Slavs and the Vedic branches. Let's look at the Vedic branch of the Indo-Europeans. Likely, a Vedic festival of Pitrupaksha was existent during the Vedic period, which was attached to the autumnal equinox as autumn was associated with the dead, more so since the sun is in the south, the direction of the dead. This festival of the dead was linked to the harvest well before the Vedic branch split from the rest of the Indo-Europeans. There were other harvest festivals in India, non-Vedic ones, and they were celebrated around September and another one in October. So the Vedic one was, must have been uh, synced to the September festival and hence it is associated with the autumnal equinox. This Pitrupaksha Diwali festival must have merged with the October harvest festivals of India when the equinoxes shifted. This makes us wonder, what's the link between the dead and the fall? Why does the dead come back during well, this time? The cold, icy winter is approaching, and the days are getting shorter, and the nights are getting longer. Precisely around this time where death occurs the most. Hence, it was but natural that the fall season gets associated with the dead ancestors. Hence, these fall festivals became a time to not only celebrate the harvest, but also remember the dead. It explains the classic significance of the light versus darkness theme of Deepavali. After all, the Skanda Purana says, lamps are born in parts of the sun, they are the speller of darkness. The autumnal equinox, when days or nights are equal, it was literally a balance between light and darkness. So as nights get longer, these lamps served as a reminder that light will prevail, that good will prevail over evil. 
Essentially, these festivals offered a sense of hope. How did this festival became from celebrating the ancestors to a festival of Lakshmi and Krishna? All the verses from Skanda Purana, there is references to Lakshmi being pleased and how she's in the oil and in the cows. Let's look at the non-Vedic festivals. Gauns have a festival called the Hulki Dance corresponding to the Pavali, but the festival is different. And these festivals, in addition to Kuparlingo, are dedicated to the goddesses. True Asiatic people of Eastern India have a harvest festival called Karam. It falls in late September, though. This harvest festival is also celebrated by Hindus, but they got it from the tribals. Long ago, there were seven brothers who would work the fields so hard, and the wives would provide them lunch. One day, the wives were busy praying to Karam Devata, the god of nature, and failed to provide lunch for the seven brothers. So the seven brothers, when finding out, were furious and threw the tree representing Karam Devata into the river. However, a calamity fell upon the village, and to remedy it, they had to find that branch and then appropriate it. Then the Karam festival was born. Like other cultures, there were two harvest festivals. The Austroasiatic festival of Sohrai is the other one. Sohrai falls on the same day as Deepavali, and earthen lamps are lit, but this seems to be Hindu influence. The actual tribal festivals are dedicated to showing gratitude to the domesticated animals. In this festival, each family and village pool a kilogram of rice, chicken, turmeric, salt, and those ingredients are used to make a kuchuri that is distributed to everyone. When cows return home, the owner will have them stamp an egg. Legend has it that Lakshmi was sent by God to tell the Mundas that they have to bathe every day and eat once every week. However, Lakshmi mixed the message up and said to eat every day and bathe once a week. God got angry that there's not enough food, so made Lakshmi every once a year to pull the plows. To provide that amount of food. Hence, the Mandas believe that Lakshmi is the one inside the cows that are pulling the plows, and this festival has a grand feast. The reason I bring up the tribal festivals, one is to show how the modern Deepavali owes half of its roots to the non-Vedic sources. The reason I mention them is to show an archetype. We see the theme of nature and agriculture and prosperity and goddesses even in the tribal festivals. Actually, the goddesses originated amongst the tribals and entered the Vedic fold, but that's a different story. So, Deepavali is a celebration of harvest and prosperity, and it's natural to be associated with Lakshmi, the goddess of wealth and prosperity. After all, wealth and prosperity can arise from a successful harvest. Cows would of course be worshipped on this day. Cows are no doubt associated with agriculture and prosperity. Wealth is associated with cows. In Sanskrit, a rich person is called Gomat, meaning a person having many cows. Next, let's see how the festival became associated with Krishna. Now, cows are worshipped on the Pavali, and cows are linked with Krishna, as Krishna is called Gopala. And this Govardhan Puja, as mentioned in the Skanda Purana and the Padma Purana, the Govardhan Puja and the Govatsa Dvadasi part of the five day long Deepavali celebration. Rudana, the mountain which Krishna lifted, itself means cow expanding. From the passages, we know that both Skanda and Padma Purana mention offering a lamp to Naraka and the destruction of Naraka. My guess is Naraka as in hell got linked to Naraka the Asura. A basal association with Krishna developed which led Deepavali to be a festival where Krishna kills Naraka Asura. Let's look at another famous part of Deepavali, firecrackers. Whether you believe it originated in China and were bought to India by Arabs and Turks or originated in India itself, what is certain is that the firecracker tradition is a late development in the larger Diwali tradition. The Skanda Purana mentions using ulkas or fire torches to show the path to the pithers, and they're made with sugarcane or castoral plant. They look like the thing you see in the picture. See how these ulkahastas foreshadow the party sparkles that we use in Diwali. The Delhi Sultanate of the 12th century was the first Muslim to participate in the Diwali using firecrackers. Actually, it was during the Muslim rule that the firecrackers began to gain prominence. My guess is that burning firecrackers became popular as it was an upgrade to lighting lamps.